Capit, Part 1 of 3 By Karl Marx Audiobook 33x55 Evidence, July 23, 1866 This report is the work of a parliamentary committee selected from members of the House of Commons, and authorized to summon and examine witnesses. It is a thick folio volume in which the report itself occupies only five lines to this effect. That the committee has nothing to say, and that more witnesses must be examined. The mode of examining the witnesses reminds one of the cross-examination of witnesses in English courts of justice, where the advocate tries, by means of impudent, unexpected, equivocal and involved questions, put without connection, to intimidate, surprise, and confound the witness, and to give a forced meaning to the answers extorted from him. In this inquiry the members of the committee themselves are the cross-examiners, and among them are to be found both mine owners and mine exploiters, the witnesses are mostly working coal miners. The whole farce is too characteristic of the spirit of capital, not to call for a few extracts from this report. For the sake of conciseness I have classified them. I may also add that every question and its answer are numbered in the English Blue Books. Employment in Minds of Boys of Ten Years and Upwards In the mines the work, inclusive of going and returning, usually lasts 14 or 15 hours, sometimes even from 3, 4 and 5 o'clock a.m., till 5 and 6 o'clock p.m., n. 6, 452, 83. The adults work in two shifts, of eight hours each, but there is no alteration with the boys, on account of the expense, n. 80, 203, 204. The younger boys are chiefly employed in opening and shutting the ventilating doors in the various parts of the mine, the older ones are employed on heavier work, in carrying coal, 8 c. n. 122, 739, 1747. They work these long hours underground until their 18th or 22nd year, when they are put to miners' work proper. N. 161, children and young persons are at present worse treated, and harder worked than at any previous period. N. 1663. 1667. And now Hussey Vivian, himself an exploiter of mines, asks. Would not the opinion of the workman depend upon the poverty of the workman's family? Mr. Bruce. Do you not think it would be a very hard case, where a parent had been injured, or where he was sickly, or where a father was dead, and there was only a mother? to prevent a child between 12 and 14 earning ones. 70. A day for the good of the family, you must lay down a general rule, are you prepared to recommend legislation which would prevent the employment of children under 12 and 14, whatever the state of their parents might be? Yes. N.S. 107 to 110. Vivian. Supposing that an enactment were passed preventing the employment of children under the age of 14, would it not be probable that, the parents of children would seek employment for their children in other directions, for instance, in manufacture? Not generally I think, n. 174. Canard. Some of the boys are keepers of doors. Yes. Is there not generally a very great draft every time you open a door or close it? Yes, generally there is. It sounds a very easy thing, but it is in fact rather a painful one. He is imprisoned there just the same as if he was in a cell of a jail. Bourgeois Vivian Whenever a boy is furnished with a lamp cannot he read? Yes, he can read, if he finds himself in candles. I suppose he would be found fault with if he were discovered reading, he is there to mind his business, he has a duty to perform, and he has to attend to it in the first place, and I do not think it would be allowed down the pit. N.S. 
139, 141, 143, 158, 160. Education The working miners want a law for the compulsory education of their children, as in factories. They declare the clauses of the Act of 1860, which require a school certificate to be obtained before employing boys of 10 and 12 years of age, to be quite illusory. The examination of the witnesses on this subject is truly droll. Is it, the Act, required more against the masters or against the parents? It is required against both I think. You cannot say whether it is required against one more than against the other. No, I can hardly answer that question. N.S. 115, 116. Does there appear to be any desire on the part of the employers that the boys should have such hours as to enable them to go to school? No, the hours are never shortened for that purpose. N. 137, M.R. Canard. Should you say that the colliers generally improve their education, have you any instances of men who have, since they began to work, greatly improved their education, or do they not rather go back, and lose any advantage that they may have gained? They generally become worse. They do not improve, they acquire bad habits, they get on to drinking and gambling and such like, and they go completely to wreck, and 211. Do they make any attempt of the kind, for providing instruction, by having schools at night? There are few collieries where night schools are held, and perhaps at those collieries a few boys do go to those schools, but they are so physically exhausted that it is to no purpose that they go there. N. 454. You are then, concludes the bourgeois, against education. Most certainly not, but, 8 c. n. 443, but are they, the employers, not compelled to demand them, school certificates? By law they are, but I am not aware that they are demanded by the employers. Then it is your opinion, that this provision of the Act as to requiring certificates, is not generally carried out in the collieries. It is not carried out. N.S. 443, 444. Do the men take a great interest in this question, of education? The majority of them do. N. 717, are they very anxious to see the law enforced? The majority are. N. 718, do you think that in this country any law that you pass, can really be effectual unless the population themselves assist in putting it into operation. Many a man might wish to object to employing a boy, but he would perhaps become marked by it. N. 720, marked by whom? By his employers. N. 721, do you think that the employers would find any fault with a man who obeyed the law? I believe they would. N. 722. Have you ever heard of any workman objecting to employ a boy between 10 and 12, who could not write or read? It is not left to men's option. N. 123. Would you call for the interference of Parliament? I think that if anything effectual is to be done in the education of the Collier's children, it will have to be made compulsory by Act of Parliament. N. 1634, would you lay that obligation upon the colliers only, of all the work people of Great Britain? I came to speak for the colliers. N. 1636, why should you distinguish them, colliery boys, from other boys? Because I think they are an exception to the rule. N. 1638, in what respect? In a physical respect. N. 1639, why should education be more valuable to them than to other classes of lads? I do not know that it is more valuable, but through the overexertion in minds there is less chance for the boys that are employed there to get education, 
either at Sunday schools, or at day schools. N. 1640, it is impossible to look at a question of this sort absolutely by itself. N. 1644, is there a sufficiency of schools? No. N. 1646, if the state were to require that every child should be sent to school, would there be schools for the children to go to? No, but I think if the circumstances were to spring up, the schools would be forthcoming. N. 1647, some of them, the boys, cannot read and write at all, I suppose. The majority cannot. The majority of the men themselves cannot. N. S. 705, 725. 3. Employment of women. Since 1842 women are no more employed underground, but are occupied on the surface in loading the coal, 8 c, in drawing the tubs to the canals and railway wagons, in sorting, 8 c. Their numbers have considerably increased during the last three or four years. N. 1727, they are mostly the wives, daughters and widows of the working miners, and their ages range from 12 to 50 or 60 years. N.S. 645, 1779 What is the feeling among the working miners as to the employment of women? I think they generally condemn it. N. 648, What objection do you see to it? I think it is degrading to the sex. N. 649, there is a peculiarity of dress. Yes, it is rather a man's dress, and I believe in some cases, it drowns all sense of decency. Do the women smoke? Some do. And I suppose it is very dirty work. Very dirty. They get black and grimy. As black as those who are down the mines, I believe that a woman having children, and there are plenty on the banks that have, cannot do her duty to her children. N.S. 650-654, 701 Do you think that those widows could get employment anywhere else, which would bring them in as much wages as that, from eights to tens a week? I cannot speak to that. N. 709, you would still be prepared, would you? flint-hearted fellow, to prevent their obtaining a livelihood by these means. I would. N. 710, what is the general feeling in the district, as to the employment of women? The feeling is that it is degrading, and we wish as minors to have more respect to the fair sex than to see them placed on the pit bank, some part of the work is very hard, some of these girls have raised as much as ten tons of stuff a day. N.S. 1715, 1717 Do you think that the women employed about the collieries are less moral than the women employed in the factories? The percentage of bad ones may be a little more, than with the girls in the factories. N. 1237, but you are not quite satisfied with the state of morality in the factories. No. N. 1733, would you prohibit the employment of women in factories also? No, I would not. N. 1734, why not? I think it a more honorable occupation for them in the mills. N. 1735, still it is injurious to their morality, you think. Not so much as working on the pit bank but it is more on the social position I take it, I do not take it on its moral ground alone. The degradation, in its social bearing on the girls, is deplorable in the extreme. When these 400 or 500 girls become colliers' wives, the men suffer greatly from this degradation, and it causes them to leave their homes and drink. N. 1736 you would be obliged to stop the employment of women in the ironworks as well, would you not, 
if you stopped it in the collieries. I cannot speak for any other trade. N. 1737, can you see any difference in the circumstances of women employed in ironworks, and the circumstances of women employed above ground in collieries? I have not ascertained anything as to that. N. 1740, can you see anything that makes a distinction between one class and the other? I have not ascertained that, but I know from house to house visitation, that it is a deplorable state of things in our district. N. 1741, would you interfere in every case with the employment of women where that employment was degrading? It would become injurious, I think, in this way. The best feelings of Englishmen have been gained from the instruction of a mother. N. 1750, that equally applies to agricultural employments, does it not? Yes, but that is only for two seasons, and we have work all the four seasons. N. 1751, they often work day and night, wet through to the skin, their constitution undermined and their health ruined. You have not inquired into that subject perhaps. I have certainly taken note of it as I have gone along, and certainly I have seen nothing parallel to the effects of the employment of women on the pit bank, it is the work of a man, a strong man. N.S. 1753-1793-1794 Your feeling upon the whole subject is that the better class of colliers who desire to raise themselves and humanize themselves, instead of deriving help from the women, are pulled down by them. Yes. N. 1808, after some further crooked questions from these bourgeois, the secret of their sympathy for widows, poor families, 8c, comes out at last. The coal proprietor appoints certain gentlemen to take the oversight of the workings, and it is their policy, in order to receive approbation, to place things on the most economical basis they can and these girls are employed at from ones up to ones 6d a day where a man at the rate of twos 6d a day would have to be employed n 1816 coroner's inquests with regard to coroner's inquests in your district have the workmen confidence in the proceedings at these inquests when accidents occur no they have not N. 306, why not? Chiefly because the men who are generally chosen, are men who know nothing about mines and such like. Are not workmen summoned at all upon the juries? Never but as witnesses to my knowledge. Who are the people who are generally summoned upon these juries? Generally tradesmen in the neighborhood, from their circumstances they are sometimes liable to be influenced by their employers the owners of the works. They are generally men who have no knowledge, and can scarcely understand the witnesses who are called before them, and the terms which are used and such like. Would you have the jury composed of persons who had been employed in mining? Yes, partly, they, the workmen, think that the verdict is not in accordance with the evidence given generally. N.S. 361, 364, 366, 368, 371, 375. One great object in summoning a jury is to have an impartial one, is it not? Yes, I should think so. Do you think that the juries would be impartial if they were composed to a considerable extent of workmen? I cannot see any motive which the workmen would have to act partially, they necessarily have a better knowledge of the operations in connection with the mine. You do not think there would be a tendency on the part of the workmen to return unfairly severe verdicts? No, I think not. N.S. 378, 379, 380 False Weights and Measures the workmen demand to be paid weekly instead of fortnightly, and by weight instead of by cubical contents of the tubs, 
they also demand protection against the use of false weights, 8 c. n. 1071, if the tubs were fraudulently increased, a man could discontinue working by giving 14 days notice. But if he goes to another place, there is the same thing going on there. n. 1071, but he can leave that place where the wrong has been committed. It is general, wherever he goes, he has to submit to it. n. 1072, could a man leave by giving 14 days notice? Yes, n. 1073, and yet they are not satisfied. 6. Inspection of Mines Casualties from explosions are not the only things the workmen suffer from. N. 234, SQQ. Our men complained very much of the bad ventilation of the collieries, the ventilation is so bad in general that the men can scarcely breathe, they are quite unfit for employment of any kind after they have been for a length of time in connection with their work, indeed, just at the part of the mine where I am working. Men have been obliged to leave their employment and come home in consequence of that, some of them have been out of work for weeks just in consequence of the bad state of the ventilation where there is not explosive gas, there is plenty of air generally in the main courses, yet pains are not taken to get air into the workings where men are working. Why do you not apply to the inspector? To tell the truth there are many men who are timid on that point. There have been cases of men being sacrificed and losing their employment in consequence of applying to the inspector. Why, is he a marked man for having complained? Yes. And he finds it difficult to get employment in another mine? Yes. Do you think the mines in your neighborhood are sufficiently inspected to ensure a compliance with the provisions of the Act? No, they are not inspected at all. The inspector has been down just once in the pit, and it has been going seven years, in the district to which I belong there are not a sufficient number of inspectors. We have one old man more than 70 years of age to inspect more than 130 collieries. You wish to have a class of sub-inspectors? Yes. N.S. 234, 241, 251. 254, 274, 275, 554, 276, 293. But do you think it would be possible for government to maintain such an army of inspectors as would be necessary to do all that you want them to do, without information from the men? No, I should think it would be next to impossible. It would be desirable the inspectors should come oftener. Yes, and without being sent for. N. 280, 277. Do you not think that the effect of having these inspectors examining the collieries so frequently would be to shift the responsibility of supplying proper ventilation from the owners of the collieries to the government officials? No, I do not think that. I think that they should make it their business to enforce the acts which are already in existence. N. 285, when you speak of sub-inspectors, do you mean men at a less salary, and of an inferior stamp to the present inspectors? I would not have them inferior, if you could get them otherwise. N. 294, do you merely want more inspectors? or do you want a lower class of men as an inspector? A man who would knock about, and see that things are kept right, a man who would not be afraid of himself. N. 295, if you obtained your wish in getting an inferior class of inspectors appointed, do you think there would be no danger from want of skill, 8 c? I think not, I think that the government would see after that and have proper men in that position. N. 297, this kind of examination becomes at last too much even for the chairman of the committee, and he interrupts with the observation. You want a class of men who would look into all the details of the mine, and would go into all the holes and corners, 
and go into the real facts, they would report to the chief inspector, who would then bring his scientific knowledge to bear on the facts they have stated. N.S. 298, 299 Would it not entail very great expense if all these old workings were kept ventilated? Yes, expense might be incurred, but life would be at the same time protected. N. 531 a working minor objects to the 17th section of the Act of 1860, he says, at the present time, if the inspector of mines finds a part of the mine unfit to work in, he has to report it to the mine owner and the home secretary. After doing that, there is given to the owner 20 days to look over the matter, at the end of 20 days he has the power to refuse making any alteration in the mine, but, when he refuses, the mine owner writes to the home secretary, at the same time nominating five engineers, and from those five engineers named by the mine owner himself, the home secretary appoints one, I think, as arbitrator, or appoints arbitrators from them, now we think in that case the mine owner virtually appoints his own. Arbitrator N. 581, Bourgeois Examiner, himself a mine owner. But, is this a merely speculative objection? N. 586, then you have a very poor opinion of the integrity of mining engineers. It is most certainly unjust and inequitable. N. 588, do not mining engineers possess a sort of public character, and do not you think that they are above making such a partial decision as you apprehend? I do not wish to answer such a question as that with respect to the personal character of those men. I believe that in many cases they would act very partially indeed, and that it ought not to be in their hands to do so, where men's lives are at stake. N. 589, this same bourgeois is not ashamed to put this question. Do you not think that the mine owner also suffers loss from an explosion? Finally. Are not you workmen in Lancashire able to take care of your own interests without calling in the government to help you? No. N. 1042, in the year 1865 there were 3,217 coal mines in Great Britain, and 12 inspectors. A Yorkshire mine owner himself calculates, times, January 26, 1867, that putting on one side their office work, which absorbs all their time, each mine can be visited but once in ten years by an inspector. No wonder that explosions have increased progressively, both in number and extent, sometimes with a loss of 200 to 300 men, during the last ten years. The very defective act, passed in 1872, is the first that regulates the hours of labor of the children employed in mines, and makes exploiters and owners, to a certain extent, responsible for so-called accidents. The Royal Commission appointed in 1867, to inquire into the employment in agriculture of children, young persons, and women, has published some very important reports. Several attempts to apply the principles of the Factory Acts, but in a modified form, to agriculture have been made, but have so far resulted in complete failure. All that I wish to draw attention to here is the existence of an irresistible tendency towards the general application of those principles. If the general extension of factory legislation to all trades for the purpose of protecting the working class both in mind and body has become inevitable, on the other hand, as we have already pointed out, that extension hastens on the general conversion of numerous isolated small industries into a few combined industries carried on upon a large scale, it therefore accelerates the concentration of capital and the exclusive predominance of the factory system. It destroys both the ancient and the transitional forms, behind which the dominion of capital is still in part concealed, and replaces them by the direct and open sway of capital but thereby it also generalizes the direct opposition to this sway. While in each individual workshop it enforces uniformity, regularity, order, and economy, 
it increases by the immense spur which the limitation and regulation of the working day give to technical improvement, the anarchy and the catastrophes of capitalist production as a whole, the intensity of labor, and the competition of machinery with the laborer. By the destruction of petty and domestic industries it destroys the last resort of the redundant population, and with it the sole remaining safety valve of the whole social mechanism. By maturing the material conditions, and the combination on a social scale of the processes of production, it matures the contradictions and antagonisms of the capitalist form of production, and thereby provides, along with the elements for the formation of a new society, the forces for exploding the old one. Section 10 Modern Industry and Agriculture The revolution called forth by modern industry in agriculture, and in the social relations of agricultural producers, will be investigated later on. In this place we shall merely indicate a few results by way of anticipation. If the use of machinery in agriculture is for the most part free from the injurious physical effect it has on the factory operative, its action in superseding the laborers is more intense, and finds less resistance, as we shall see later in detail. In the counties of Cambridge and Suffolk, for example, the area of cultivated land has extended very much within the last 20 years, up to 1,868, while in the same period the rural population has diminished, not only relatively, but absolutely. In the United States it is as yet only virtually that agricultural machines replace laborers, in other words, they allow of the cultivation by the farmer of a larger surface, but do not actually expel the laborers employed. In 1861 the number of persons occupied in England and Wales in the manufacture of agricultural machines was 1034, whilst the number of agricultural laborers employed in the use of agricultural machines and steam engines did not exceed 1205. In the sphere of agriculture, Modern industry has a more revolutionary effect than elsewhere, for this reason, that it annihilates the peasant, that bulwark of the old society, and replaces him by the wage laborer. Thus the desire for social changes, and the class antagonisms are brought to the same level in the country as in the towns. The irrational, old-fashioned methods of agriculture are replaced by scientific ones. Capitalist production completely tears asunder the old bond of union which held together agriculture and manufacture in their infancy. But at the same time it creates the material conditions for a higher synthesis in the future, viz., the union of agriculture and industry on the basis of the more perfected forms they have each acquired during their temporary separation. Capitalist production, by collecting the population in great centers, and causing an ever-increasing preponderance of town population, on the one hand concentrates the historical motive power of society, on the other hand, it disturbs the circulation of matter between man and the soil, i.e., prevents the return to the soil of its elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing, it therefore violates the conditions necessary to lasting fertility of the soil. By this action it destroys at the same time the health of the town laborer and the intellectual life of the rural laborer. But while upsetting the naturally grown conditions for the maintenance of that circulation of matter, it imperiously calls for its restoration as a system, as a regulating law of social production, and under a form appropriate to the full development of the human race. In agriculture as in manufacture, the transformation of production under the sway of capital, means, at the same time, the martyrdom of the producer, the instrument of labor becomes the means of enslaving, exploiting, and impoverishing the laborer, the social combination and organization of labor processes is turned into an organized mode of crushing out the workman's individual vitality, freedom, and independence. The dispersion of the rural laborers over larger areas breaks their power of resistance while concentration increases that of the town operatives. In modern agriculture, as in the urban industries, the increased productiveness and quantity of the labor set in motion are bought at the cost of laying waste and consuming by disease labor power itself. 
Moreover, all progress in capitalistic agriculture is a progress in the art, not only of robbing the laborer, but of robbing the soil, all progress in increasing the fertility of the soil for a given time, is a progress towards ruining the lasting sources of that fertility. The more a country starts its development on the foundation of modern industry, like the United States, for example, the more rapid is this process of destruction. Capitalist production, therefore, develops technology, and the combining together of various processes into a social whole, only by sapping the original sources of all wealth. The Soil and the Laborer Part V The Production of Absolute and of Relative Surplus Value Chapter 16 Absolute and Relative Surplus Value In considering the labor process, we began, see Chapter 7, by treating it in the abstract, apart from its historical forms, as a process between man and nature. We there stated, if we examine the whole labor process, from the point of view of its result, it is plain that both the instruments and the subject of labor are means of production, and that the labor itself is productive labor. And in note 2, same page, we further added. This method of determining, from the standpoint of the labor process alone, what is productive labor, is by no means directly applicable to the case of the capitalist process of production. We now proceed to the further development of this subject. So far as the labor process is purely individual, one and the same laborer unites in himself all the functions, that later on become separated. When an individual appropriates natural objects for his livelihood, no one controls him but himself. Afterwards he is controlled by others. A single man cannot operate upon nature without calling his own muscles into play under the control of his own brain. As in the natural body head and hand wait upon each other, so the labor process unites the labor of the hand with that of the head. Later on they part company and even become deadly foes. The product ceases to be the direct product of the individual, and becomes a social product produced in common by a collective laborer, i.e., by a combination of workmen, each of whom takes only a part, greater or less, in the manipulation of the subject of their labor. As the cooperative character of the labor process becomes more and more marked, so, as a necessary consequence, does our notion of productive labor, and of its agent the productive laborer, become extended. In order to labor productively, it is no longer necessary for you to do manual work yourself, enough, if you are an organ of the collective laborer, and perform one of its subordinate functions. The first definition given above of productive labor, a definition deduced from the very nature of the production of material objects, still remains correct for the collective laborer, considered as a whole. But it no longer holds good for each member taken individually. On the other hand, however, our notion of productive labor becomes narrowed. Capitalist production is not merely the production of commodities, it is essentially the production of surplus value. The laborer produces, not for himself, but for capital. It no longer suffices, therefore, that he should simply produce. He must produce surplus value. That laborer alone is productive who produces surplus value for the capitalist, and thus works for the self-expansion of capital. If we may take an example from outside the sphere of production of material objects, a schoolmaster is a productive laborer, when, in addition to belaboring the heads of his scholars, he works like a horse to enrich the school proprietor. That the latter has laid out his capital in a teaching factory, instead of in a sausage factory, does not alter the relation. Audiobook generated by Read with the Ears.